We have a really good lineup for panel two as well, beginning with Jeff Maroka of Lawrence Livermore, moving on to Mark Zagger of Vestas, Colleen Call of PNNL and Vijayant Kumar of Sentient Science. So I'm going to turn it right over to Jeff. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, if you can hear me and see me, I'll, hit, I'll get this going. Looks great, Jeff. All right, so thanks everybody. Um, this is largely uh, an extension and follow-on of a lot of the overview that Sue gave yesterday. So I'm gonna speed through a lot of this. My goal here is to provide a little bit more of a forward look um, relative to what Sue provided yesterday, which is a little bit more of the history of our accomplishments as a team. But I wanna look at how MMC is going to evolve as we move towards offshore complex terrain and the integration with artificial intelligence. Um, this is uh, a motivating slide that kind of shows how what we think of as engineering is of course an atmospheric science problem as well. Um, beyond the wind turbine effects, really everything that makes this an interesting photograph has to do with mesoscale atmospheric and in this case oceanic inputs. Uh, there's a lot to discuss here. We've seen some, some great overviews of all of the interesting ways that the ocean interacts with the surface. So I'm not gonna read through this list here, but suffice it to say that we know this is important. The real question is how do we do this? Um, Yesterday, Sue described a number of different ways that we can couple mesoscale and microscale. Matt talked a little bit more about that earlier today. I'm gonna to discuss the most general high fidelity way of downscaling, which is to simply use um, embedded higher, ref more refined meshes to drill down from mesoscale to microscale processes, getting to where we have finely resolved turbulence on an LES domain. Um, this kind of simulation setup is one that I think we're all familiar with. Um, of course, what we can do with the buildings in here is we can replace those with wind turbines, including the actuator models that we've implemented, our team has implemented into WARF, and we can actually capture a mesoscale frontal passage. Here you can see the wakes of the turbines, and here comes the frontal passage coming down from the north, wind changes direction, speeds up, turbulence increases, all of this great stuff. We can capture this using our setups. Um, so the question is, is this everything we need? And of course it's not. Um, so as we described yesterday at a high level, um, one of the things that we realize is that we need to seed the inflow of a LES domain like this fed with mesoscale boundary conditions that don't contain any of the resolved scales of turbulence that we care about. Otherwise we end up wasting our computation um, in the domain waiting for turbulence to spin up. Domingo is going to be speaking later at one of our breakout sessions. He'll describe methods that we've developed in collaboration that he's extended, but we have other methods developed throughout the laboratories. And looking forward, we'll be um, examining these in a variety of more complicated setups to assess their strengths and weaknesses. Another question you could ask about this simulation is, okay, well, you're, you're adding turbulence perturbations, but how good is your flow coming into this domain if you have to go through the terra incognita in order to get there? Um, again, Sue described this in some detail um, earlier. What we are focusing on as a forward look are a couple of things. Number one, we have done a little bit of work in understanding how nesting strategies can influence the results of the micro scale domain embedded within it. Raj Rai is gonna be discussing his work in this area later on today at one of our breakout sessions. We also heard quite a bit about the 3D PBL scheme. Um, as Bronco mentioned, this is a scheme that's just being developed in real time. There was even a question in the chat about, you know, whether we thought this could, could help in different situations. So one of the roles of our project um, going forward is to assess and examine um, the use of this scheme in lots of mesoscale to microscale coupled applications, especially moving into more complicated operating environments to see if it can improve our modeling within the Terra Incognita. Another thing that was mentioned yesterday at a high level was how we're using artificial intelligence based approaches to improve MMC. One of the examples given um, was the surface layer modeling. Um, there's also some work in atmospheric downscaling using um, AI based techniques. There is going to be some discussion about this as well in one of our breakout sessions later today. Um, another approach that wasn't mentioned yesterday but that we're also looking at as a team 
is using explicit canopy um, methods and their extensions to more generalized uh, frameworks for improving the implementation of the surface boundary condition. Um, we've heard many times now that Monob Obukov is, you know, it's great for what it does, but it always posits a logarithmic increase. It's only applicable in steady homogeneous conditions. We're moving away from that as we go down scale and as we go to more complicated operating environments like complex terrain and offshore, we can improve um, upon the fidelity of the simulation simply by replacing Mononobukov with an explicit canopy method that has the same effect of roughness you see in this simulation here contributed by Ed Patton a number of years ago. You have many more of these low speed ejections um, of low momentum air up into the boundary layer. You have increased bulk drag. So this really changes your, uh, your resource assessment um, depending on how you implement the surface boundary condition. And what's interesting for our project is coupling these approaches with artificial intelligence and going into complex terrain and offshore environments where we know that Mononobukov simply isn't gonna work for us. We've thought as a program a little bit about how to integrate artificial intelligence more generally throughout the workflow. Um, as was discussed yesterday and earlier today by, by Matt, you know, using higher fidelity models all the way down from the mesoscale to the micro scale is really expensive and requires a lot of expertise and it's probably beyond the scope of, of a lot of workflows. But what we can do is we can do the physics and apply the artificial intelligence to facilitate uh, ways of connecting what are the relationships between the drivers, these complicated drivers and the ultimate things we care about, which are loads, power, integrating in the context of a hybrid plant, for example. And there's already been a little bit of thinking around this already in some of our um, sort of strategy planning that goes on behind the scenes. We even have a really great acronym for this that Paul Veers came up with. But the idea here is, you know, to integrate AI more effectively in the design envelope or the supply chain um, to both do the discovery um, that is required but also to improve these lower fidelity uh, design codes that the industry will find useful. So this is a lot of this framework has been developed in relatively simple terrain on the onshore application. But of course, we want to move the entire program into more complex operating conditions, including complex terrain and offshore. I want to show a quick example of some of the work that we've done um, moving into the offshore environment. This is a simulation that was conducted by a colleague at UC Berkeley of the Pertigau field experiment. This is a wharf multi-scale simulation. This is the LES domain with the terrain from Pertigau. This is a wind turbine. This is a virtual tether sond that mimics the actual transect from the field campaign. What we note here is that this um, setup is able to capture a lot of the features that we observed a little bit of turbulence. This is a stable simulation, so the, the wake tends to follow the terrain downstream. We get some nice turbulence ejection here when, when we have these gravity waves with this hydraulic jump. We validated the ability of wharf to capture the gravity wave. The top is wharf rendered in the same color scale as a bunch of overlays of simultaneous LIDAR scans shown below. So we can capture this uh, element of the physics, the gravity wave, and the implications on on, on the flow. We're also able to duplicate another often observed um, phenomenon that during stable conditions, the wakes tend to follow the terrain downslope, whereas during convective conditions, they tend to um, waft upwards. This simulation shown here is from a stable solution, but we actually ran this over the full um, time series and uh, the, over a full diurnal cycle. And during the daytime, when you have convection, you can actually see that wharf is able to capture the upward transport of the wake due to the action of convection with the recirculation um, that lifts that wake upwards. So we're making progress. Um, we can do things now with one turbine in one sort of arrangement of terrain. Um, the next step is, of course, to do multiple turbines operating holistically, uh, the word of the day, in, in arbitrary terrain complexity. The biggest challenge, of course, the one that we've been talking most about is the transition into the offshore. Um, again, we've, we've seen all these wonderful, um, rich details that we want to be able to capture. And of course, 
then there's the actual water um, with all the fun uh, new physics that we have to consider and understand. And of course, the giant floating turbines that will be in there. So the role of this project is to try to understand the physics of what's going on with all of these interactions. And again, um, to utilize AI to help us both facilitate our understanding as well as practical um, model developments that we can use to facilitate workflows. I'll end with this slide. Um, this is a movie that Matt Churchfield and his colleagues made using wake steering to deflect the wake downstream, um, showing how you can operate, you can exercise controls um, to extract more power. Um, we can do this now using today's tools in pretty simple operating environments. These are great proofs of concept, but what we really need is to be able to bring these tools and approaches into the more complicated operating conditions of complex meteorology, complex terrain, and the offshore setting. So with that, um, I encourage you to let us know in the breakout sessions later today what we're overlooking, what your highest priorities are. And again, I encourage you to please attend these sessions because we really want to hear what you have to think. So with that, I think I'm at the end of my time. I'll stop sharing and hand this over. Thanks so much, Jeff. Great talk. Um, we're going to directly hand this over to Mark Zagger now of Vestas, who's going to talk about how industry is actively using the high fidelity modeling tools. I think you're muted, Mark. We don't hear you, Mark. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Perfect, sorry for that. So it was quite hard to find what to speak about after all these fine speakers before me yesterday and today. Um, but I will start with the fun fact. So do you know that if you want to um, invest in a wind farm and you borrow your money at 5% interest, you will pay 53% to the bank and 100% to Vestas. So that's why we um, are trying to understand the uncertainty of the performance prediction of the wind plants and uh, relate that with the risk and the cost of financing and trying to find out what are the most important components of this uncertainty so that we can drive them down. Um, before I dive into that, I would just like to um, show up where we are when it comes to predicting the power of the energy output of our wind plants. Um, so we have, um, I think, reached um, our goal in estimating the lifetime um, plant energy output um, as a time series of 20 or more years of predicted performance by um, downscaling the WARF model down to 300 meters uh, and then uh, considering everything as a time series that can be later matched with the demand patterns with the price patterns and it can be used to size the storage for example so that we can predict um, for the future of the wind plant, um, what kind of hybrid um, mix um, would be the most uh, interesting to, to, to make so that the customers can get the most for their money. Um, so we have um, invested in a little bit of the supercomputing here, which is not a big uh, investment as we see it because um, the value of it that comes out, so the, um, the value created by the driving the uncertainty down and the understanding it, it's, it's much bigger than what it costs to have a supercomputer for now, but things might change, of course. Um, so to have a lifetime a time series of 10 minutes of uh, wind conditions and everything else, the full climate at all points in the grid where we plan to build a wind plant, it's really important to, to have and not least to also be able to drive the um, component degradation profiles into that. Um, but saying that, of course, we this is not the end of the end of the game. So, uh, for example, what Matt Churchill, Churchill uh, spoke before about, I cannot agree more. So that there is so much potential for real microscale modeling in getting the interactions between turbines and how the uh, how the flow and the climate drives the response of the turbine to climate conditions. That's very important. That's that's where the uncertainty um, is still. Um, Quite significant and should be um, driven down. Um, so why we talk about uncertainty so much? Um, 
it's because uh, we are at the at the business side of everything. So we are working with the customers, who whose main concern is to, um, depending on the type of the customer, either um, getting certain return on their investment. So for example, the pension funds, uh, and I'm not a financial guy, so I'm saying finance for dummies here, but I am a dummy. Um, but we have several kinds of customers, like ones that um, invest more of their equity in the wind plants and other customers who have to borrow the money first to invest in, in renewable energy. And there are different customers um, and there are different uh, things that are important for them. Uh, so the other um, driver is of course, lower cost of financing. Um, not, I, I'm not saying lower cost of energy because that is um, like implicitly understood. But what I mean by lower cost of financing is uh, summarized pretty well in the famous equation for levelized cost of energy up here, um, where the lifetime costs are divided by uh, into capital expense, which means uh, to, to buy equipment and to finance your investment, your loan, and to operational expenses, which is basically the cost of service divided every divided by the total energy produced in the lifetime of the plant. Um, and the financing, it's a pretty sizable um, contribution to the capex. As I said, it's, it can be up to one half of the capex. It is huge numbers. And it uh, depends on the perceived risks of the people who are financing the project. Uh, and as we stand now, um, the graph on the left, it's from 2016, but I don't think that conditions have changed so much in that four years. Maybe they have, but not so much. Uh, the thing is that the, this perceived risk um, is higher for the wind than it, than it is for the PV, for the solar, um, which means that the interest rates, um, so the cost of financing of wind installations, it's still higher than the solar installations. And it's all expressed in uh, famous uh, weighted average cost of capital, which is basically the price of the loan, interests, uh, and some other metrics. Um, for example, what is your um, a proportion of the investment that is um, uh, equity like cash and what is the, the um, invested into loans. Uh, and it depends on the tax rate and some more things. It, you can go into details, but the main um, message here is that um, given the, so that the difference in this uh, WAC uh, will drive the level as cost of energy a lot. So for example, um, for the, double uh, WAC, uh, wind becomes uh, as LCOE intensive as the solar. So in principle, solar is more expensive, but because the financing for the wind is more expensive, the LCOE becomes similar. So we want to drive this financing cost down and we can drive it down by reducing the risk, which is to removing the uncertainty components of the calculation. Um, so, and uh, how can we achieve that? We can achieve that by um, more accurately predict the energy of the plant that will produce. Uh, and moreover, in order to satisfy the demands like auctions that do not only um, request the highest yield uh, year to year or in a lifetime, but uh, has more targeted uh, components like to actually deliver energy at the proper time. And also we want to deliver energy when the price on the market is highest. Uh, this is an important thing we can, where we can help and the other one is, of course, to accurately predict the service cost, which is the OPEX, which is the other part of the um, equation of the LCOE. And again, here, it's important to know the customer. Um, and what are the activities that we see that are top three, let's say, or at least in my eyes and from where I'm standing in, in, in our organization, um, the activities that are aiming aimed to reduce the uncertainty of the prediction of energy and service cost is the interaction between the turbines. So it's of course the wake um, and the, the blockage effect. Uh, the wake effect can be really, really strong. So we have seen wind farms with 20 or 25% losses due to wake um, because simply the uh, stability of the atmosphere was not appreciated enough at that time, like in 2012. Um, and it's funny because I, I'm saying that here I'm looking at these problems from five to 10 year uh, perspective. I am not uh, very visionary, but I have like 10 years of experience and I can probably see that uh, things that have 
taken 10 years to change will in the future take only five years because everything that is related with technology is moving in an accelerated manner. Uh, so 10 years ago, stability, to mention a stability was like you, you fell from Mars, right? So it, everything was just nice and neutral and um, uh, we were living in the surface layer and we were using uh, the standard theory models and everything was nice and dandy. So it's no longer so. So we have these machines uh, sitting at 200 meters above the surface they are one kilometer apart. So the concept of, of microscale when it comes to at least the wind resources um, is, is a bit different than it used to be. Uh, the second bullet here is called, I, I name it operational optimization. It is maybe um, targeting, uh, let's say wake steering that um, Jeff just showed before. Uh, and of course, um, to do the wake steering properly, you have to know the conditions that you're doing that in pretty well. And I just don't think we are there yet. It's easy to, to demonstrate wake steering efficiently on a straight line of four turbines, but when it comes to a wind farm of 150 machines, that's a little bit different. And the last one here is the um, energy conversion of one generator. Um, and what I want to say here is um, that um, from where I'm standing, so from the um, um, this side of the business where we are basically working with power curves still. So we rely on power curve that is a kind of design uh, specification um, of the turbine uh, is describing its performance properly. And when we just simply um, take apart the turbine um, power output um, by the time of day, we can see that there are significant differences of how the turbine performs during the day with uh, higher turbulence uh, and during the night with lower turbulence. So there are big differences um, that are, um, of course, the consequence of the flow flowing through the rotor and the control systems able or not able to react to that. And here is, I think, um, one of the big challenges. So, so how to understand what the turbine response will be to any state of the atmosphere in here so that we can predict um, what, uh, how much the turbine will output and here, uh, I want to say that from the, this classic uh, concepts of half height wind speed and rotor average wind speed and shear and turbulence intensity wear and whatnot, I think we should just scratch that and um, simply consider the five dimensional. So all variables and three dimensional and time dependent um, five the microclimate and uh, work with that. So how, how that turns into a turbine response. So aerodynamically response to all kinds of climate uh, with low level jets, without low level jets, um, in the boundary layer, outside boundary layer, because 300 meters above the surface, boundary layer um, is absent quite for some period of time. So, so this is basically uh, one of the big challenges to, to make the industry understand that um, moving away from this simple um, concepts might pay a big back in when we come to reducing uncertainty of the power estimates in the future. Um, so, and then on the last slide here, um, what is the supporting technology to achieve that, uh, what I have um, been talking about, it's really to, to become really um, even more, let's say, um, advanced in the resource and estimating the climate trends, so uh, not to forget the climate change and how the wind conditions will look like in 20 years. Uh, and uh, I like to, to talk about one, let's say, visionary thing, and I think Matt uh, has uh, had a comment yesterday uh, what about the data, data simulation in the wind farm? And I, I agree, I think this is um, the way to go. The way to go to, to simply um, enrich the detected flow from the, all the instrumentation in the wind farm. Um, so, and use that to enrich the models describing it. I think that's where, where the golden egg is lying, the golden nugget, you will call it. Um, and uh, with this statement, I would like to just end my presentation. Thank you. That was really interesting, um, Mark. I think uh, you gave us a really great um, industry perspective, uh, things that we need to remember. Um, as you stop sharing, I'm, we're going to be passing over toward uh, to Colleen Call of Pacific Northwest National Lab. And Colleen is going to talk about mo uh, evaluating model errors. All right, thank you, Sue. Right. And specifically, let's see. There we go. All right, 
Um, yeah, thank you. So, right. and, yeah, specifically, I'm going to be talking about um, a body of work that's been done at PNNL, looking at parameter sensitivities, um, quite a bit on mesoscale models, and more recently looking towards microscale, specifically large ID simulation models. Um, so I have to thank my colleagues at the lab, Larry Berg and Win uh, Chan, and also point out that the mesoscale results have um, been published in a series of articles and, and actually new work is coming out hopefully soon that I don't, don't even have time to put into this. So um, definitely uh, check in with us if you want to know more about the work that's going on and has been done. So our motivation here is to use U, UQ techniques, um, but really focusing on building our understanding of what the important parameters are in our models because there are quite a few, unfortunately. Um, and really we wanna know how does the model sensitivity arise through the phys uh, specific physical assumptions of the models and how is it tied to the actual flow of physics? Um, how can we relate it to things that are physically interpretable? So uh, some of the goals of identifying the sensitivity, uh, practically speaking, are to determine how we can better use observational resources to constrain sensitivities. So um, the origin of some of this work was in planning the uh, wind forecast improvement project two. Um, so to understand what, what, what should we be measuring in these field campaigns to help us the most. Also, if we can find that the sensitivity is uh, mostly dependent on a few parameters, that's really useful information to designing future studies to enable uh, ensemble modeling, it's uh, really useful. And finally, it helps us to develop insights that we can use to further improve parameterizations. So I'll just give the basic approach and a few highlights, um, not in too much depth just because of time limitations. Uh, so our we use a perturbed parameter ensemble methodology. Uh, first, we identify some schemes that are um, widely used and relevant. So for instance, at the mesoscale, we've looked at the uh, uh, MYNN and YSU PBL schemes, also the MM5 surface layer scheme. These are all as implemented in WARF. Uh, at the microscale for LES, we're looking at the Deardorff one and a half order TKE based turbulence closure. And so all these models uh, involve a number of parameters, which I've put in parentheses. Uh, once we have the schemes and parameters identified, and sometimes they're hiding, you don't, you know, so you have to check exactly what, what is isn't being hardwired even in your model. Uh, you need to define the ranges of parameter values that's an important step. And so from, for this, we look at literature, uh, theoretical limits. Sometimes we have to just use our intuition about what a plausible range is. And then we run an ensemble of simulations using these perturbed values and selecting via uh, quasi Monte Carlo or uh, Latin hypercube sampling techniques. So these ensembles are uh, in the range of dozens to hundreds of simulations. So it's a, a computationally intensive uh, exercise. And then finally, once we have the full model ensembles uh, uh, simulated, we can construct models of the responses uh, using uh, various approaches such as generalized linear models, random forests, that sort of thing. And that can allow further statistical analysis. Um, so we have been focusing on the Columbia Basin region. Uh, it's kind of our local, local area and uh, has a lot of interesting uh, terrain and is important for wind energy. Um, so in the mesoscale work, uh, it began with identifying periods during the Columbia Basin Wind Energy Study. Um, this is because WFIP2 actually hadn't been performed yet. And so uh, looking at both February and May to get some seasonal contrast and also checking different PBL schemes. And the simulation methodology was to use a 10 kilometer wharf parent simulation that was then nested down to three uh, and three and a third kilometers. And so for each, for this study, for each parameterization and case period that was being studied, there were 256 uh, ensemble me members. And the uh, diagram there shows you the simulation domain and sort of the variability in the terrain uh, that um, occurs through the domain, the 10 and three kilometer domains. So the focus of this mesoscale, uh, this mesoscale UQ, UQ analysis has been on the 80 meter winds um, and looking at seasonal and uh, time of day effects. So these maps show that simulation domain colored by the percent of variance uh, explained by each parameter. So this is only a subset of the parameters. 
And um, you can see that, so the uh, four important parameters are shown here, the dissipation rate, the Prantle number, and two uh, quantities related to the leg scale. The main takeaway here is that aside from the dissipation rate parameter, which is really always quite important um, and has a similar pattern of importance uh, in both May and February, other parameters show a very strong difference um, in their effects depending on season. And if we go ahead to the nighttime, here we actually see that the uh, these sensitivity maps are really similar between seasons. And so what this really clearly points to is that the uh, stability conditions are very uh, dominant in how they affect the, uh, the sensitivity. And this natu fairly naturally follows both from what we know about the flow of physics and from the way the uh, mesoscale model is set up. So it depends, for instance, on stability functions. And these stability functions are um, dependent on, for instance, the Richardson number. So uh, looking at the Richardson number, we show a map of it here. You can see even, at, even in the night, there's um, you know, a range of values uh, between uh, neutral and stable conditions. And if you look at the stability functions, you can see this maps to different stabilities of parameters related to say this B1, which is the TKE dissipation rate. But um, while I can't go into it in too much detail, uh, this is sort of a key way to understand. You can wrap in other dependencies too, such as wind speed or uh, terrain and land features. You can encapsulate in a Richardson number um, effect. And if we look at different PBL schemes, um, so the analysis was repeated using the YSU scheme, uh, which is another uh, very commonly used boundary layer scheme. And you can see that both the MYNN and YSU schemes do get this diurnal cycle of wind speeds. Um, you know, they capture the main features. Um, there's some differences in when they show their greatest variance, depending on night or day. But um, an interesting thing that comes out from this ensemble-based uh, approach is that there is a uh, distinct uh, daytime bias in the MYNN scheme for this, this site. And we can attribute to actually to something about the fundamental formulation of the model rather than just uh, a parameter calibration. You can see that this uh, YSU PBL scheme is actually able to cal uh, capture the daytime behavior. So this is a really interesting side effect of this UQ analysis that we can, we can see where the models fail in a very uh, systematic and structural way. Uh, so now jumping to some more recent uh, efforts on looking, applying the same approach to uh, large eddy simulations, uh, again, sticking in this Columbia Basin uh, region and using data from the Wind Forecast Improvement Project too. So uh, we selected two case periods that uh, had some uh, similar features in that they had high westerly winds and large surface heat fluxes. And the Elias domains are set up to include uh, a site that had um, anemometers at 50 and 80 meter elevations. And we've set up our wharf runs to have a, a mesoscale domain nested to uh, two Elias domains at 150 meter and 50 meter resolution. And then uh, we tested uh, parameters of the Deerdorf TKE based subgrid seal closure. And so these figures show uh, the 10 minute averaged wind speed over the period of the large eddy simulations. Um, the color lines are the two LES domains, the mean over the ensemble. The uh, ranges are, uh, the shading is the range of all the ensemble members. You can see there's actually a big range. Um, and also some systematic differences between the two different uh, resolution LES domains. Um, so this just gives you an overview of, of the uh, features of the ensemble. But we didn't want to look just at the, the wind speed from our LES. We'd like to get some more turbulence information um, and some more information about the boundary layer structure. So we went ahead and computed a, a number of additional statistics from the, the ensembles. And what we find, and this is perhaps not uh, too surprising given that we selected uh, convective type cases, but the sensitivity of most of the quantities we look at is dominated by the coefficient that multiplies our eddy viscosity, um, C sub K is, is how it's usually known. But there are some complexities to this. So for instance, uh, when we look at quantities that are related to turbulent fluctuations, uh, the, there's a strong sensitivity, but then at some range of parameter values, the sensitivity really flattens off. Um, so you can see this here in this scatter plot of the ensemble members with um, the parameter value. And you can see at low values, it's just 
this seems to be randomly scattered and more detailed analysis also shows it's a, you know, there's not a, a strong, there's not really any trend that we're not, you can't see from the scatter plot. Um, so uh, good news is within this range that's insensitive, we, we can actually get pretty good agreement with the uh, data from the anemometers. You can also see that with the wrong choice in your uh, parameter, the results are very poor. So we have some values in which the LES essentially laminarizes, we lose our turbulence. And just as an aside, if you do the same exercise with different numerical schemes, you actually do get somewhat different results. So numerics matter for LES as well as uh, the parameters. Uh, but if you look at some other quantities, they're actually more sensitive at low values of this uh, important coefficient. For, so for example, the wind shear. Um, looking between the 80 and 50 meter levels where we have uh, observations as well. And here the sensitivity levels off at high parameter values. But again, we can uh, get agreement with our observations. And thankfully, the range at which this occurs agrees with the uh, turbulence quantities. So that is, that is good news. Um, so let me just wrap up quickly because I'm to my 10 minutes. But uh, this just demonstrates how we've used UK, UQ techniques to understand parametric sensitivities um, within WARF, uh, identifying possible error sources, um, looking at things like the seasonality, time of day, um, and other um, sort of correlations within the sensitivity. And uh, the, you know, the model sensitivities, they are, they are large, they can be practically important, and there's a lot of complexity to unraveling their details. However, on the positive side, what this work has shown is that Generally speaking, the sensitivities are dominated by a few parameters and that we can understand these sensitivities uh, by relating them to flow physics we know, uh, especially for the mesoscale models. So Sue reappeared, so that means my time is up. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, great to see that uh, the estimate of the uncertainty that really is becoming the theme of this particular session is how to deal with uncertainty, whether it be in calculating levelized cost of energy, um, estimating uncertainty, et cetera.